Thursday, everybody. Hope you're having a good day today so far. Look, I'm not going to do much jibber-jabbering before I jump into today's episode. We're just going to get right into it with part two of the strangest unsolved mysteries in America with number 26, Montana. The Vortex and House of Mystery. Just 13 miles from Glacier National Park, you can pass through a portal in which the laws of nature are set aside. A gravitational anomaly forces trees to grow sideways and makes people appear as much as six inches shorter. A shack in the vortex, called the House of Mystery, is the home to bizarre phenomenon. A marble rolled on an incline will travel upward and a rope hanging from the ceiling falls in a curve. Well, that's weird. I've seen this uh, forest before, um, and the trees look so weird. But I heard that actually um, it's something that they did to the trees that made them grow that way, like on purpose. But I don't know. Um, so it's a sacred site. Um, it's celebrating 49 years of family fun. Native Americans were the first to recognize this naturally occurring phenomenon and still honor it today with offerings of tobacco and sweetgrass. When visitors pass through the portal, they can see and feel the power of the vortex and they enter a reality where some physical worlds like gravity and perspective are decidedly skewed. Adults and children alike will enjoy this unique experience and many people come back year after year to feel the power of nature. So they have guided tours. Um, the famous House of Mystery is a cricket shack that sits right in the center of our smallest and most dynamic vortex. So I would assume... Oh, God, my... I'm just... God. <laughs> I started moving my hand and I saw my shadow and it freaked me out. My God. Because um, I'm recording these back to back. And so when I was recording the first part, there were a couple pictures that popped up when I was talking about different stories, and I just did not like the pictures, and they just kind of creeped me out, so my shadow just scared me. Anyway, I'm assuming that this house of mystery is a lot like um, that house that they used to have at Six Flags that used to lean. I wonder if I can remember. what's What was the name of it? Okay, so the name of it was Casa Magnetica. Was that it? I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, Casa Magnetica. Um, so here's a picture of it. My God, this was so much fun. So it was the hard to wrap your brain around tilted house. Um, it was built at either a 24.6 degree angle or a 34 degree angle, which made you feel completely disoriented, especially if you just stepped in from the blinding blast of 100 and degree, 110 degree heat and were feeling a bit queasy from one too many pink things. I loved it. Things rolled uphill, you couldn't stand up straight, and your brain was mighty confused. The text were on the back of the postcard seen above, so it said the mysterious Casa Magnetica, Spanish section. Gravity has no meaning. Water and ball run uphill. Standing on level ground is difficult. All visitors to fabulous Six Flags over Texas are amazed. And they started doing this in 1962. And um, I remember this being like one of my favorite things to go do at Six Flags. Um, this is just a bunch of newspaper clippings from it. Yep, there was the entrance to Casa Magnetica. Oh, my God. I know these pictures were long before I was ever born. They're from the 60s. Man, I wish they had pictures of it from when I was younger. That is so cool. So, yeah, my God, 
I remember this. Man, this brings back such great memories. Oh my god, they brought it back? Oh, they're doing it again. Oh my god, I want to go so bad. I cannot believe they're act I know this has nothing to do with the the episode, but man, how awesome. God, I remember this. You, you just don't understand the memories that this brings back. I mean, it is different because it was not this colorful when I went, but it almost still looks exactly identical. Yeah. Uh, see, they didn't... If you're a blind viewer, you don't even know what I'm looking at, but this didn't exist when I went as a kid. It didn't look like all this, but uh, outside the decorations, most of it is pretty much the same. Man, that makes me want to go back so, so bad. All right, man. Okay. Um, I don't know if it costs money to go to it. Um, it says it's by far one of the most paranormal places in America. Who knows? But I'm not seeing... I don't know if it's caught. Yeah, so it's twelve dollars for adults and six for children ages, or eight dollars for children ages six to twelve, and five and under are free. So there you go. If you want to go check that out. All right, moving on. Number twenty-seven, Nebraska, the lucky fifteen. On March 1, 1950, the 15 members of the Beatrice's West Side Baptist Church Choir were supposed to meet for practice. All of, all of the 15 were known for their timeliness, but on this day, they were all running late. Every single one of them. The reasons varied, but not a single one was present when a natural gas leak caused the complete destruction of the church. Even Snopes can't discount the mystery here. Why and how were every single one of the 15 spared a grisly death? That's easy. Divine intervention. God intervened. So, this is the way I look at it. If I'm running late, let's say I'm, I'm, I wake up late to get ready for work and I'm running behind, I always look at it as, and it's, obviously it's not the case for every single time you're running late. Sometimes you're just late because it's your fault and you weren't, you know, you didn't set your alarm, whatever. But sometimes I look at it as, you know, we're being prevented from being on the road at a certain time because maybe there was going to be a wreck if we had been there at that time. Or maybe something was just going on. Or something was happening at the store. It, you just never know. So I always look at it as it was just there was a reason why I was not able to leave on time, get to work on time. That's how I view it. Divine intervention. Number 28. Nevada. Ah, okay. Who murdered Tupac Shakur? So in 1996, hip star, uh, hip hop star Tupac Sh Shakur was killed in Las Vegas during a drive-by shooting. The story begins with a failed attempt on his life two years earlier, according to History, which Shakar blamed on producer Sean Puff Daddy Combs and rival rapper Christopher Wallace, or Notorious B.I.G. Wallace was murdered six months later in Los Angeles. No arrest has ever been made in either case. So I've always wondered if a lot of people thought that it was Notorious B.I.G. that killed him, did someone go and kill notorious big in revenge for him killing tupac maybe or maybe the same person killed both of them who knows anyway number 29 uh actually if you want to learn more about that story um if you go watch um kendall ray she does a lot of these mysteries like this. She has a very good two-part series about Tupac's murder, and it's actually pretty informative. Number 29, New Hampshire. The Disappearance of Rachel Garden. In 1980, 15-year-old Rachel Garden bought a pack of cigarettes at a market in Newton and was never seen again. The friend whom Rachel told her family she was going to be spending the night with denied having plans with Rachel that night. A witness claimed to have seen Rachel talking to three young men outside the market, but none of the men were ever charged. In fact, no one has ever been charged, and there are no suspects. Nearly 40 years later, the case appears to be hopelessly cold. 
Well, what if she just left? What if she ran away? I mean, I know it's probably highly unlikely, but I'm just what if? You never know what she was dealing with, and maybe she just left. Number 30, New Jersey, the Phantom Sniper. In 1927, Camden was terrorized by what's been described as a phantom or ghost sniper. Bus and car windows were shattered, and even a policeman was struck, but no bullets or casings were ever found, and no one ever saw an actual sniper. One witness reported hearing a man's laughter, but no one else saw or heard a thing. The attack suddenly stopped in 1928. To this day, no one knows why they began or what they really were. The school actually caught a ghost on camera, and no, it's not a prank. Oh, so that has nothing to do with nothing. That's a different story. I thought it was going to say that the school, uh, the ghost sniper was at the school, and they actually caught it on camera, but then that defeats the purpose of them not knowing. Number 31, New Mexico. What was really going on in Roswell? By the way, did anybody ever watch that show when it was on the CW? Roswell, did anybody watch it? I didn't. Just curious. All right. It all started in the summer of 1947 when a Roswell rancher found mysterious debris in his sheep pasture. The Air Force claimed the debris belonged to a crashed weather balloon, but the citizens of Roswell didn't buy it. They believed it came from a UFO. Fifty years later, the military revealed military revealed that the debris came from a top secret atomic project so it probably wasn't a ufo but what was it and why has the u.s government come up with at least two different stories about it well i think the reason why the government covers up things like this is because for the fact that they are probably doing some type of testing with new technology and they're just trying to keep it as secret as possible so other countries don't find out about it they just, they don't want anyone to know that maybe they have this really brilliant technology that they've been working on. Which, I mean, why would you? Number 32, New York. Who was the leather man? During the second half of the 1800s, a leather-clad hermit wandered around Westchester and Putnam counties, never speaking, and unlike other wanderers of that time period, not looking for work. He was, however, happy to accept a meal and returned once a year, on the same day, to the homes that were generous to him. He was known to sleep in caves. His body was discovered in 1889 in a cave on the Dell family farm in Briarcliff. To this day, no one's sure who he was or why he wandered. He was just a wanderer. Number 33, North Carolina, the shadow of the bear. That's actually a very cool picture. Going bear hunting has its own unique meaning in cashiers. During the autumn months when the sun is shining, the shadow of a bear is visible on Whiteside Mountain just before sunset. Romantic Asheville suggests you shoot this unexplained phenomenon with your camera. Okay, so that's it? I thought there was going to be like more to that story. But it is a cool picture, honestly. Number 34, North Dakota. Eugene Butler's Crawl Space. Niagara, about 40 miles west of Grand Forks, was founded in 1882 and has never been a big town. In fact, today it has less than 100 residents. But back in the early 1900s, there were at least six more people there than anyone knew about at the time. In 1915, the bodies of six people who had been bludgeoned to death were discovered in the crawl space of a house that had once belonged to the reclusive Eugene Butler. He died in 1911, several years after being committed to a mental hospital. Their identities remain a mystery to this day. Oh, so he was a serial killer that kept his victims' bodies. Okay. Number 35, Ohio, the Circleville Letters. So this is actually a very interesting story, if it's the same one that I'm thinking of. Yeah, 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 it is, it is. Very interesting story. I think Kendall Ray does one on this too. So in 1976, residents of Circleville began receiving harassing letters, taunting and threatening them with tidbits about their personal lives. After the murder of one resident and the attempted murder of another, police arrested Paul Freshour, uh, but while he was in prison, the letters continued. Six months after Fresh Hour's release, television's Unsolved Mysteries aired a segment only to receive its own short letter. Forget Circleville, Ohio. If you come to Ohio, you El Sickos will pay. The Circleville writer. The identity of the letter writer remains unknown. And I think there was a reason why they claimed that even though um, that they're, 
that some people thought even though he was in prison, he still could have been writing the letters. But there was actually something, um, they did actually prove that there was no possible way. And I don't remember what it was. So number 36, Oklahoma, the Jack uh, Jameson family. In 2014, Bobby and Sherilyn Jameson drove out to look at a property in Red Oak they were interested in purchasing. Their truck was discovered days later, along with their wallets, IDs, phones, $32,000 in cash, and their dog. Their remains, along with their young daughters, were discovered by hunters a month later. No cause of death could be determined, and no one knows what happened to them. Although theories abound, including that the family faked their deaths and joined the witness protection program and the family's supposed involvement with cults and or witchcraft. So there's actually video footage of them before they left, like moving stuff and loading stuff into their truck and how they were very robotic and acting kind of weird. And then there's a photo of their daughter, but she looks uncomfortable and they're wondering if she, someone was forcing her to take that picture with her family um, and then killed them all. It's very weird. Number 37, Oregon, the mysterious shrieks of Forest Grove. The small town of Forest Grove is generally a quiet town, but in 2016, the quiet was shattered by reports of an otherworldly shrieking sound that seemed to emanate from nowhere and everywhere all at the same time. Some managed to record the screeching sound, which has been described as being like that of a train careening wildly on metal tracks, except there's no train nearby. The shrieks cease soon after, and no one has ever been able to figure out what caused them or where they might have been coming from. Actually, last night, it sounded like there was uh, someone screaming outside my house, like, uh, like a man yelling. Um, it was kind of far away. Couldn't make out what was being said or if anything actually was being said. And I also felt like I heard music. I don't know. It was kind of creepy. Not that it was anything. Just kind of reminded me of that, how I didn't know where it was coming from, but I could hear it. Really weird. Number 38, Pennsylvania, boy in the box. So this one's weird. In 1957, the body of a young boy was discovered in a cardboard box in the woods outside Philadelphia. Authorities failed to identify him, and no one came forward looking for a boy that fit his description. The crime scene yielded no clues, but in 1960, a psychic led the police to a foster home where the boy might have lived. But a definitive connection between the boy and the foster home couldn't be made, and the case remains cold all these years later. Well, that's because psychics aren't real, so, duh. That was dumb. That's a really weird story, too, and it's like, why would you put him in a box in the woods? And I'm actually quite surprised that how many of these I've actually already heard about. Because I thought I'd hear stuff that I'd never heard before. Number 39, Rhode Island. Where is Adam Emery? In 1993, Adam Emery disappeared just hours before convict being convicted of murdering 20-year-old Jason Bass in a road rage incident. Emery was out on bail pending formal sentencing. Um... Police found his car abandoned on Newport Bridge. Less than a year later, his wife's remains were found in Narragant, uh, Narragansett, I don't know what that is, Bay. Some believe Adam and his wife jumped to their deaths from, what that, from that bridge, but the FBI still considers Emery one of America's most wanted criminals. Okay. Number 40, South Carolina, The Lizard Man. Starting in the summer of 1988, Browntown residents began seeing what's now referred to as the Lizard Man, a seven-foot-tall creature with red eyes and incredible superhuman strength. The first sighting involved a car being mauled by the creature. To this day, the mystery hasn't been solved. Reports to Smithsonian, and there have been sightings as recently as 2015. Um, so that kind of reminds me of a story that my dad used to tell me about. Um, so I guess it's a big deal. Home of the Lizard Man, Harry and Harry too. Um, okay. So there's a story that my dad used to tell me about, and I wonder if, um, there's anything about it on DuckDuckGo. So there's actually two stories, and it's uh, about, it's in Lake Worth, Texas, 
about the goat man. Um, maybe I will do a story on this one day because it's actually kind of cool. Um, I'll just, okay, so it's about a goat man, okay, from the 60s. And I'm not going to tell you any more about it because it's actually a very cool story. But there's not only that story that he told me about. Okay, so there's nothing up on the internet about it, but he used to tell me this story about the baby-faced deer, which it was a deer with the face of a baby. And I swear, if you ask my dad about it, he will get so serious, and he will look at you, and he'll be like, do not ever ask about the baby-faced deer. That was traumatizing, and I told you not to bring it up. So he's very serious about it. Now, I know he's lying, but anyway... It's an interesting interesting story, but maybe we'll talk about Goatman later, or later today if we have time. Number 41, South Dakota, The Strange Fate of Tom Cuter. In 1994, Tina Marcotte called a friend to say she had a flat tire, but that her co-worker, Tom Cuter, was going to help her out. Tina was never seen or heard from again, and when Tom was questioned by police, he disputed that he'd been in touch with Tina on that day. The next day, Tom was found dead. He had been run over by his own forklift. Was it an accident? Suicide? Homicide? And what happened to Tina Marcotti? Or Marcotte. I don't know how you pronounce it. That's strange. Um, number 42, Tennessee. The uh, Craig Miles Mausoleum. So, I, that's God, that thing's huge, too. Wow. It's actually kind of beautiful. In 1871, Nina Craig Miles was killed at the age of seven when the buggy she was riding in was hit by a train. Her family had a ma mausoleum built for her and future deceased members of the Craig Miles family of fine white Italian marble. Shortly after Nina was placed there, red streaks and splotches began to appear in the marble. Efforts to clean the marble failed, and each time a family member's body was placed in the mausoleum, more red stains appeared. There's no scientific explanation for the stains. Some believe they are Nina's tears. That's creepy. So, but who was she? I mean, was she anybody important? Hmm. Yeah, so it talks about the building of the thing. So this guy says that he walked around the mausoleum and he saw the stains. And even though I'm not the most psychic person in the world, I can feel the sorrow in that place. That's, is this actually a picture of the mausoleum? And the other one on the other thing is not? So it's in um, Cleveland, Tennessee. And it's at um, Gothic Revival St. Luke's Episcopal Church. So, if you ever want to go look at it. Okay. Gideon Blackburn. That's, that's, I know that name. How do I know that name? I don't know. Moving on. 43. Texas. All right. Texas. The girl behind the Amber Alerts. So, Amber Hagerman was a nine-year-old Arlington Girl Scout when she was kidnapped while riding her bike on January 13, 1996. A witness quickly told the police he'd, been, he'd seen a girl being forced into a black van. Despite a massive search, Amber was never seen alive again. Her body was found five days later, about four miles from where she had been taken. Her killer has never been found, but her abduction led to the invention of Amber Alerts, which... Has anybody else noticed, um, if you live in Texas, how many Amber, Alert, Amber Alerts we've been getting lately? They're so frequent these days, it's, it's just ridiculous. So this is a picture of Amber, um, which I think, you know, doing what they did because of this was actually a very good thing to do. Um, she was taken from a local grocery store, 
Um, so the only description was a blue truck that was seen leaving the scene. Lopez was, so Detective Ben Lopez of Arlington PD remembers the afternoon. So Lopez was quickly pulled into a special task force to find Amber. Um, thousands of tips have poured in over the years, most in the weeks and months after Amber vanished. A handful are still phoned in every month. Despite all this, officials say they are no closer to solving Amber's case. That's so sad, man. It really is. I didn't quite understand what was going on, Riker Hagerman, now 25, said. We cannot, we want closure and we want justice. That's really sad that they still don't know. Um, so, apparently, so there, her body was found, right? So, they established a coordinated system with local law enforcement whereby they could warn the public when a child was kidnapped, which is the Amber Alert, obviously. In December 2015, Facebook announced a partnership with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children so that Amber Alerts would show up on users' news feeds and notifications would be sent to those in the surrounding areas. Um, I haven't seen any of these Amber Alerts on Facebook recently, just on my text, so maybe that's changed. Number 44, Utah, Jean-Baptiste Great Escape. So Jean-Baptiste was a notorious grave robber in Utah. When his grave pillaging came to light in the late 1800s, Baptiste was banished to a remote island in the Great Salt Lake, the equivalent of solitary confinement. Three weeks later, he was gone. What little evidence authorities could find indicated that he might have built a raft in order to escape, but he was never seen or heard from again. <clears throat> Number 45, Vermont, <clears throat> the Bennington Triangle. The Bennington Triangle refers to an area of Vermont surrounding Glossenberry Mountain where several people have disappeared without a trace. These include a trail guide who vanished in 1945 while leading a hunting party, college student Paula Jean Weldon, who disappeared the following year from a hiking trail, and James Tedford, who seemingly vanished from a bus headed for Bennington. Since the disappearances were clustered in the 1940s, there's speculation of a serial killer, but others believe paranormal forces are at work. Number 46, Virginia, the Old House Woods. In the quaint seaside town of Diggs, Virginia's Old House Woods was once a popular hiding place for soldiers and pirates, so naturally it's become a hot spot for paranormal activity, including sightings of a ghostly woman and accounts of skeletons dressed in armor wandering the woods. People have reported finding themselves filled with dread while walking in the forest. Horses are known to become spooked for no apparent reason. Even paranormal investigators are creeped out, often unable to continue their investigations. Okay. You know, it's funny how, like, animals have, like, this sixth sense, and they know, they can tell when something's not quite right, whether in, in the area you're in or another person that's around you. They just kind of know. It's really weird. Number 47, Washington, how Jason Padgett became a math genius. In 2002, Jason Paget, a furniture salesman, jock, and self-described partier from Tacoma, was savagely attacked by two men outside a bar, leaving him with a se severe concussion. When he recovered, he had acquired the ability to visualize complex mathematical objects and physics concepts intuitively. According to Live Science, Paget is now one of 15 to 25 cases of so-called acquired savant syndrome, people who developed abilities after suffering a head injury. Ah, man, that's actually, I mean, that's terrible what he suffered through, but, you know, it could have been worse because he could have ended up with amnesia or some, like, you know, very debilitating, um, like, just a very debilitating life that he couldn't continue without help or something. Number 48, West Virginia, the octopus mystery. Danny... Casalero was a freelance writer who came to Martinsburg, West Virginia in 1991 to meet with a source about a story he codenamed The Octopus, which involved high-ranking government officials and an international cabal. Casalero was found dead in his hotel room. Authorities labeled it a suicide, but Casalero's family believe he was murdered. Okay, that's a weird story. Um... 
Did this freelance reporter become so disheartened in pursuit of the biggest story of his life, a story that struck even one of his best friends as improbable, that he retreated to a hotel room miles from home, got into a bathtub and slashed his arms as many as 12 times, or was he murdered because he knew too much about a scandal that reached to the highest levels of government? Probably the latter. Yeah. All right, number 49, Wisconsin, the demon bunk bed in the tall man house. In 1987, the Tallman family brought a second-hand bunk bed to their home in Horkin. For the next nine months, the family was haunted by what appeared to be poltergeists, clock radios turning on by themselves, a paintbrush that dipped itself in paint, and worse, including the children becoming ill despite no previous health problems and an unexplained fire. The haunting ceased only when the Tallman family destroyed the bunk bed. See, I don't know if I necessarily believe that that stuff actually happens. All right, number 50, Wyoming, the Devil's Tower. Various Native American tribes view the Devil's Tower National Monument as a sacred site and have their own origination stories about the massive stone structure. And science fiction fans may recall that the mythology of the structure played an important role in the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I've never seen it. Geologically speaking, it's made of volcanic material and is connected in some way to an existing or previously existing volcano, but precisely how it came to exist continues to confound scientists. Um... I don't even know. I've never even heard of this. So, um, well, I thought this was going to be a link to, like, the actual, but it's nothing. Okay, so I have a little time. I will tell you all about the goat man. So, let me tell you all about the Goat Man really, really quickly. So, <clears throat> Goat Man. Numerous sightings in July 1969 led to the belief of a half-man, half-goat creature living in Lake Worth in Texas. Terry Decker, a reporter, wrote an article about it in the newspaper, which made the front page. The headline read, Fishy Man-Goat Terrifies Couples Parked at Lake Worth. The couples that reported the sightings described it as a half-man, half-goat with fur and scales. A man named Tommy Burson soon after reported the creature landed on his car after jumping out of a tree. An 18-inch scar on the side of his car was shown by Burson as proof. The police at this point decided to investigate. Up until then, they had laughed at any reports they received, thinking it was a hoax. Rob Denkos pointed to a patch of brush on the north side of Lake Worth across from Greer Island and held up the grainy black and white photo. Yep. Um, it was probably, I think it was probably in this area because it had brush. All right. Um, there's the photo of it. So witnesses describe the creature as half man, half goat, towering seven feet tall and weighing 350 pounds. Hairy, horned, and covered in scales, the beast was reportedly seen running across a cliff and tossing a pickup truck tire 500 feet. A story about the uproar appeared in the Star-Telegram in July 1969, and WFAA followed up with the report the next day. Just about the time man, in all his wisdom, decides that he has this world and everything in it all figured out, along comes something he can't explain. Jerry Taft relayed from the scene. At the time of Taft's report, the legend was pure hearsay. The rumors, though, were enough for police to fear that a mob of rifle-toting citizens would try to take the matters into their own hands. The rumors also inspired a short book written by Benbrook, Sally, and Clark. Clark's The Lake West Monster of Greer Island, Fort Worth, Texas, part of which is uh, has been posted on the Tarrant County Historical Journal website, featured a picture of Greer Island and an ominous warning. Somewhere deep in the thick underbrush, the Lake Worth monster hides. What he could write about the people that chased, followed, tracked, and shot him may be as interesting as what the people have said and written about him. Clark, who died in 2009, interviewed more witnesses to the monster. Five people claimed they saw the monster break the limb of an oak tree, Clark's book had a picture for that, showing a thick limb snapped like a toothpick. Another man, Jim Stevens, claimed the monster, real big and human-like, with burn scars all over his face, arms, and chest, jumped on the hood of his Mustang one night, hanging on until Stevens crashed into a tree. Now new tonight, a pretty wild scene today at Texas Motor Speedway. Take a look at that. Okay. You can see in this oh video from God. some of our viewers, there was some sort of explosion at the track. We I'm sorry, where is that TMS plate? For more information about what happened and whether there okay. were any injuries. Okay, if you're a blind viewer, you wouldn't have heard that. Uh, if you're watching YouTube, you would have heard that video pop on. God, that scared the crap out of me. 
But the lasting image of the mysterious creature came that fall in November when a man named Alan Plaster snapped a grainy picture of what appeared to be a woolly beast walking through high grass. The nature center is full of mystery, Denkos said. This is just the biggest one, maybe the most over-the-top one. Yeah, um, it actually is probably one of the biggest ones uh, for sure. I've heard about it all my life. I've always thought it was interesting, although I don't believe that there really is a goat man. Um, but it's, it's a cool story that, you know, it's an urban legend from the area that I grew up in, which is kind of cool. And I happen on that other website that I was looking at, um, they had a link here for uh, haunted places in Texas. So maybe one day I'll do an episode on just all the haunted places in Texas, just because I think it's cool. Anyway, I hope you had a fun time uh, for the part two. Um, I, I actually am surprised that most of the stories I have heard of before it's actually uh, interesting. I must watch a lot of stuff about like true crime and mysteries and unsolved things. Uh, well, I do because I enjoy that kind of stuff. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it too. So I'll leave all of my stuff down in the description box to my social media. You can still buy t-shirts. Don't forget to please sign the petition to protect women in prisons. If you're a blind viewer, please go to Anchor, Google, Apple, Spotify, um, go ahead and subscribe to the podcast. Leave me a review. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe to like and share the video. Leave me a comment and I'll get back to you. And also the biggest thing you can do for me is to support me by subscribing and clicking the notification bell. So, you know, every time I upload a new video and I will look forward to seeing you back here on Friday with an episode that I got the idea from my dad. So anyway, have a good rest of your day and God bless.